Look, I've just set up all of this filming and I've realized that my, uh, <laughs> uh, I am missing a nail for my thumb. So just ignore that and, and we're, we'll talk about the musical that made me cry. Okay. We have waited over a decade for Next to Normal to come over to the UK. It's one of those musicals that I, I myself have been waiting and waiting for, begging that they would bring it over. And honestly, if we had to wait this long to get a production of it, I think it was worth it that we got this version that's playing currently at the Donmar Warehouse in London. This musical is tough. It is very heavy. There is a lot of very difficult questions asked and it dives into a lot of very serious issues. I loved this production at the Donmar, so what made Next to Normal work? Let's find out. But if you haven't seen my face before, hi, I'm Ellie. I talk about theatre. I do reviews, I do discussions, I do video essays, and if any of that sounds interesting to you, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me, it helps out the channel. But let's move on to talk about Next to Normal. I think this musical has a very strong plot. I think that's something that carries it through its book is incredibly well crafted and well developed. The story of the musical centers around Diana, a loving housewife to two children. However, we quickly find out that Diana is suffering due to her mental health issues. The musical surrounds Diana and her journey through this, her trauma that she's experienced, and it carries such strong themes of loss and family and it's all of these things that are like my biggest triggers with like shows, I guess, is, is, is that's the term. Like these are the things that get to me the most. These themes are the ones that pack the most emotional punch for me. And my God, it, it just manages to completely touch you and it explores it in such a careful and well-constructed way. These are not easy themes to tackle on stage, but you can really tell that such care has been taken to making sure that they do this right. It's very sensitive with how it portrays a lot of the issues and really how Diane is suffering. This book kind of splits you up. You have so many different perspectives on this family and you can see where the cracks are forming, where things are falling apart a little bit. There's so much stress placed on each of the characters that they go through such incredible journeys for the show, especially the one that gets to me a lot, uh, especially in this version of the show, was Natalie's story struggling with that lack of attention from her parents, experiencing love for the first time. There's so much to her story, there's so much to her character, and it really builds on it. You feel so much sympathy towards Diana and her struggles. You feel so much sympathy towards Dan and how he's struggling to kind of keep the family together, how he's trying to do his best for his wife. It, there's so many layers to this, and there's so many complexities. No one is in the right, no one is in the wrong. It deals with so much, and the way that it does it so successfully must be applauded. Speaking about mental health issues and the actual like condition that Diana is suffering from, they they expressly say in the show that it can be multiple different things, but I, they do put a specific label on it, uh, which is confirmed in the program. Uh, it, it is bipolar disorder. I just wanted to double check and make sure that I got that completely and utterly right. Obviously, I am not someone who suffers from this condition. I am not someone who has this life experience. So I can't say 100% for sure whether everything that they do in the show is 100% correct, whether everything that they do is a perfect representation. But from my perspective, from where I'm sitting in this, it feels very well explored. It gives it the weight that it really, truly needs. Then there's the music of this show as well. And I, I, I adore it. I have always adored the score to this show. I think that pacing wise, it works extremely well. 
and I just love this kind of like rock infused score with all of these levels. I feel like the punkness really starts to come out in the music, especially with characters like Gabe. I'm Alive, they do in this production where they actually have him come out with a mic stand and a mic and you feel it so much. I think there is something, there is something about a character rocking out to a song with a handheld mic that just, it brings it up, it elevates it, it makes it extra spicy and I love that. I love this take. It's why Spring Awakening works so well. <laughs> it's why Spring Awakening, do you know why Spring Awakening works so well? Because you give them microphones and it makes it punchier. It gives that extra oomph behind it and I'm Alive just whacks you right there. As well as that, I, I actually find myself enjoying a lot of the more, I guess, incidental songs. Didn't I See This Movie is an absolute bop. And it's such like a fierce number where she's really, you can tell Diana is really starting to fight and you can see her confusion and her anger building up at the situation that she's in. There's, there's so many that you l literally could go through this entire score, name by name, song by song, and just rant and rave your adoration towards it. Everything else is such a wonderful introduction to Natalie. You have the different variations on Hey, which is the starting of this beautiful relationship that's building up. You have Superboy and the Invisible Girl, this absolute anthem of angst and frustration of being left behind and forgotten. I miss the mountains as well, such a wonderful solo for Diana. I've been as well for Dan, just really builds up his character as well. There is so much to love about this score. I think every single song serves its purpose to the musical wonderfully. And now let's talk a little bit about the staging, because this is a complete new production. They haven't taken the Broadway version and moved it over. They've got complete new staging, a new director, and it's so nice to see. The set is very simple. We are in a pretty basic suburban house. You've got your kitchenette and it's placed on a revolve. And with the use of projections and these blinds that lift up to reveal the band behind the stage on the on a top level of the stage even, it's so not behind. There are, there are, but you can see them. They're not behind the set. <laughs> you start to see this kind of very basic, typical, what you would call nuclear family, kind of start to fracture, and you start to see behind the kind of facade of it. Facade. There's some very clever uses of projection here. What one moment I really liked is when they kind of projected onto the floor onto the revolve in a circle, kind of shining a light onto it, and it started to shudder and shake as Diana's having this kind of, what I'll describe as a panic attack. It's a very simple moment, a little simple bit of projection and lighting that really builds onto it and shows this sense of instability. It's such a small detail that really heightens a scene. Now, there are some moments in the show where the projection is a little bit, um, I would say unneeded. For example, psychopharmacologist, that's a long word to say, psychopharmacologist and I. See, this is what happens when I try to film a video. My brain and my mouth, they don't connect. In the song, My Psychopharmacologist and I, they use this projection of like falling pills and I guess it kind of, fits the vibe of the song and the kind of like, I guess it's a bit tongue in cheek in a way, that's how I describe it, but I don't know. It's, it's, I don't think it adds very much to it other than being quite nice to see some variation of the design of the floor. Where it more works is in the subtler moments, the moments where they kind of fracture the setting where they highlight the difference between the section on the revolve and there's a bit of stage that's not on there to kind of highlight different spaces being used. Allowing for two scenes to play at the same time and for you to really contrast what's happening. There is a lot of really great use of this throughout the show and it is very effective when it works. And in the moments where I didn't think it worked, it wasn't a detractor. There's also some amazing moments of 
imagery on stage. There's one section here, and I am going to spoil something for this show. So if you don't want spoilers, I'm going to leave a timestamp on screen right now. It's right here. This will skip you past this moment where I'm going to describe a certain bit of scenery that they use and a bit of a prop that they use that, honestly, if you are going to go watch this show, don't spoil this. This was so shocking. I, I, this is something I wouldn't want spoiled. I don't normally do this, but because... I, because I think this moment is so effective, there you go. Gone, ready, only the people who, who like spoilers, okay. Towards the end of Act 1, there is a moment where Diana is looking through a box of Gabe's stuff, and that scene ends with her trying to take her own life. We don't see the actual attempt, but what we do see is the box, the kind of plastic tub, starts to leak out blood all over the stage and you see this very pristine kitchen this set that is very like dull and drab colors be just covered in this absolutely giant puddle of red blood it is such a striking bit of imagery and you're kind of distracted in that moment you're looking away a bit the show takes your attention away, so when you notice, when you look back and just see this river of blood, the realisation just starts to come down on you, and it is such a dark, effective moment that really highlights the seriousness of what Diana is suffering through. Michael Longhurst does a really good job at taking these moments and really giving them the impact that they need through this staging. But honestly, I think one of the driving factors behind this show, and I think the key reason why now was the perfect time to bring it over, was this cast. I don't have a bad word to say about any of this cast. Every single person really takes the time to explore their characters and gives some phenomenal performances. Casey Levy plays Diana, and what a beautiful portrayal of such a difficult character. There is so much you have to highlight in this show. There is so many complexities to this character, and Casey just delivers on breaking your heart. Her performance of I Miss the Mountains is one that I don't think I'm going to forget in a very long time. It's so beautifully done. It really takes you on that journey. You can tell watching her that so much care has gone into this role and you can tell how much she's wanted to play this role. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Jamie Parker as Dan really explores a character who I felt like in previous versions was very easily hateable. I felt like when I was listening to the Broadway version of this show, I was very much against Dan's character. Whereas Jamie really takes the time to show his struggles as well, how he's trying to cope. And I think what comes through and what shines through about his performance is that he is really trying. He is really trying to do what's best, not only for Diana, but for his family. But he's struggling with the balance of it. And there's only so much that he can do. And then, I'm not going to spoil the moment, but the moment, his final moment on stage at the end of Act 2, when he says that one word, gets to you, just gets you right in the stomach. That is one of the highlights of the night. Such an emotionally intelligent performance. Eleanor Worthington Cox plays Natalie. She is dealing with a lot in the show, Natalie. There's some wonderful contrast in the show between her relationship with her boyfriend, Henry, and the relationship between her mother and her father. Eleanor just understands this character, bringing that perfect angst to the role, and selling some of the most popular songs in this show. Her performance of Superboy and the Invisible Girl, wondrous. Another performance I feel like I'm going to be talking about forever and ever is Jack Wolf as Gabe. 
There is a clip going around right now of Jack Wolf performing I'm Alive, and all you need to do, he, this clip, it's from, it's from, like, the rehearsals. It's from the room. Like, it's not actually on stage. You don't see any footage of it on stage. That clip enough is to tell you why he deserves an Olivier nomination for this. And I even maintain that statement with knowing how many new musicals are up for nominations this year and how tough this year is for new musicals. He deserves this Olivier nomination for his performance of I Am Alive Alone. Just, oh, the fire, the angst behind it, the layers of the character. It's so interesting to watch. And Jack Wolf has the, he has this look about him. He, he does come across and he looks very young, which makes the show work even more. Just, I know it's such a little thing. It's such a little casting thing. And it's not even something he's doing, but it just adds layers to the show. It's a bit like casting a young looking Evan Hansen. We all know why the film of Evan Hansen didn't work. Because when you cast someone young looking Evan Hansen, the story makes more sense. And I feel like in a similar way, in a similar vein, that applies to the role of Gabe as well. Just, just a phenomenal portrayal. Just, just, oh my God. I feel like I am not even describing why it was such a good performance because I can't get over the fact that it was such a good performance. <laughs> okay, I feel like I've gotten over just the just the praise. Let me, whew, okay. I think what makes his performance work so well is the different ways he twists it. You know, in moments he comes across as very innocent and then there's moments where it becomes more dark because we start to peel off the layers and we start to get more of a sense of the story and what's actually happening here. And the more darker twists on the character, all coming and being believable from the same actor, just, ooh. There's also fantastic performances from Trevor Dion Nicholas, who plays both of the Doctors in the show. It's a smaller role, and it's a role that I feel like doesn't really allow the kind of development that a lot of the other ones do, but Nicholas is such a strong presence on stage that it, it doesn't even really matter, honestly. He makes such an impression, even in the first number that he has, that he could honestly just do that and and I would still be talking about him in this review. And Jack Ofrizio, who plays Henry as well, is another character who obviously is outside the family and doesn't get as much development, but I absolutely adore the contrast to Dan. I adore that about how this script is laid out. And Jack's Henry comes off as such a lovely guy. He comes off as so charming. He's a really nice presence in this very heavy musical. He's very much needed to kind of counterbalance it and kind of provide that little spark of hope, you know? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? That makes sense. I'm going with that. <laughs> Next to Normal is an incredibly intelligent piece of theatre. It is a musical that dives into some very heavy source material, some very dark places and treats it with a lot of respect and really gives it time to breathe, to explore it and to explore how mental health can affect people. I think it's an incredibly important musical matched with just a, a, a score that is firing on all cylinders. It is wondrous. It is absolutely a must see. But what do you think? Have you seen this version of Next to Normal? Have you seen any other version of Next to Normal? Let me know all your thoughts on this musical in the comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me. It helps out the channel. Here's some links to my videos on screen right now and a link to my Instagram if you want to drop me a follow over there. But that's it for me today and I hope to see you next time. Bye.